This is uh, News at Prime. Let's get into another important conversation now. South Africa's National Nuclear Regulator has approved a 20-year life extension for Quebec Unit 1. The extension comes just a few days ahead of the expiry of the unit's existing license. The nuclear power station provides at least 930 megawatts to the national grid. ESCOM had applied for this extension back in 2021 along with a request to separate the operating licenses of Quebec Unit 1 and 2. The decision on whether to extend the license for Unit 2 has been deferred to November next year. Quebec Unit 1 now joins 120 reactors worldwide uh, that have continued operations beyond their initial 40-year lifespan. All right, let's get uh, some perspective on this now. And we are joined by energy expert Helmut Winkler. And we're also joined by former National Nuclear Regulator Director Peter Becker. To both of you, gentlemen, good evening and uh, thank you very much for your time. Can I start with you, Peter Becker, as someone uh, who has been in this space? Talk to us about the, the risks here because the longer the plant runs, uh, I would assume that it becomes more riskier to run. What's the situation at uh, the Unit 1 in Kuberg? No, absolutely right. And I think there are three factors that affect the risk. The first one you mentioned is the age. Uh, same as an old car, the older something gets, the more prone it is to failure in one or other system. And another factor is the design of the plant. It's what's called a generation two design. And these were plants that were designed and built before the experiences of Chernobyl and, and Fukushima. Uh, and after those incidences, several uh, design features were became requirements for nuclear plants and we moved into generation three plants. Mm. And then the third factor that's a risk factor is um, the fact it's run by ESCOM. And there's been a great exodus of skills from specifically the Kuberg nuclear plant. A lot of uh, people from there went to Abu, um, Abu Dhabi, I think. And um, we have uh, far fewer skills than we used to have. And ESCOM, uh, I think we don't need to remind ourselves, has quite a poor record when it comes to maintenance and safety of their plants. Oh, those are very, very strong words. Uh, Mr. Winkler, coming from Mr. Mm -hmm. Becker there, what would worry the public more, I would think, is exactly the last two points he makes. Can I start with the exodus of skills? Do we have enough skills then to run um, such an old plant, but, you know, trying to make it almost come across as a new vehicle, even though we know it is an old one? Yeah, well, it's... The whole question of safety is always a, a, a difficult one. Is is a nuclear plant absolutely 100.0% safe? No, it's not. It's a bit like saying that, okay, uh, if you get into an, uh, an aeroplane, are you going to be fine? Most of the time, you, you, it, it will be fine. But is it impossible for a plane to crash? No, no it, it can happen. And so we, we're looking at a similar situation with, with, with any nuclear plant. Uh, yes, Eskom has lost quite a few people. Um, it's difficult to say to what extent are they still going to be able to run the plant. Yes, yeah, sure, uh, routine tasks I'm sure can be done as, as in the past. Uh, what worries me most about uh, a Kuberg at the moment is that this whole life extension exercise has taken much longer than they originally uh, uh, said it would. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be 10 months, five months to uh, upgrade unit two, and another five months uh, for unit one. Uh, they started with unit two. It, it, it was um, a disaster, let's put it that way. After seven months, they didn't manage to uh, to uh, install the steam generators, which they were supposed to. Mm. Uh, so uh, they again uh, then stopped that process and started then with unit one uh, late. That took a whole year, not five months. And Unit 1 uh, then started operating again at the end of last year. Yeah. And it's been running since then. As far as I can tell, it hasn't, hasn't uh, stopped. So it seems to me that uh, that 
operation was successful. But of course, they are still busy with Unit 2. And that's also why Unit 2 hasn't uh, received its its uh, 20-year extension uh, license. Yeah. C can we talk about that Unit 2, Peter Becker, as to the deferment here? Why do you think that is? Well, there are a host of issues that have been identified with the plant. And most recently, uh, in 2022, the International Atomic Energy Agency visited the country and they drew up a list of problems that they found at Kuburg. And uh, they said these, I think there were 14 of them, have to be addressed before it can be considered safe to extend its life. Now, unfortunately, the NNR in their briefing today said that they don't follow the IEA. It's, in other words, they said that it's not a requirement that the IEA approves of the safety measures being taken at Coburg. It's up to the NNR itself to decide. So that's that's concerning. We do know that there have been uh, several problems identified. For example, the equipment that monitors the containment shell, which sees if it um, can handle the pressure mm. and if the cracks in it are expanding or, or proceeding or not, that equipment has failed and is not oper operable. So the I IAEA, which is an agency of the United Nations, said this ought to be fixed before it goes ahead. But ESCOM's response has been that, no, don't worry, they've got other mechanisms to monitor it. They can measure the crack and see if it's getting worse um, and so on. Uh, that was specifically on Unit 1. And so we don't need to follow the recommendations of the International Atomic Energy Agency. So there are a whole host of issues that were identified by, by that agency, including a crack in one of the um, sump areas where radioactive material was contained and that was leaking out. So there are many many issues. Mm -hmm. And really this whole process, and I think you touched on this earlier, has been incredibly rushed. I mean, we are now less than seven days away from when the license expires. This is a process that should have been completed at a leisurely pace. It should have been started many, many years ago. And what should have happened is first a consultation with the regulator to find out what were the requirements of making Kuburg safe before spending the money. But it's all been done in a reverse order. ESCOM made a contract. They, they signed that contract with um, Framatome, which subcontracted to companies such as Jacobs Engineering, deciding to do the life extension. After they've contracted for that work, they approached the NNR and said, oh, can we have an approval? And that really is not really the right way around to do things. So yeah. there are many issues that have not been addressed. And the NNR was um, not able to say that uh, they can carry on with Unit 2. But because Unit 1 was about to expire, they've made that decision, which I believe has been quite rushed uh, to say that Unit 1 can continue operation. Mr. Winkler? If the process has been rushed, and let's remember, we're talking about a, a very old plant here. I think if uh, my information I have in front of me here is indeed correct, we are talking about a plant that was first commissioned in July of 1984. Uh, Peter yeah. Becker spoke about the plant design and that this is a generation two design. Now, if you're trying to work this machine so that it operates as though it were a relatively new one, the, the rushed element, the comments about it being rushed, should we be worried here? Uh, well, certainly, uh, I, I fully agree. This process was handled very badly. Uh, this should have been sorted out a, a very long time ago. And uh, also, uh, we've always had this understanding that, uh, yes, we had this, this IAEA uh, visit, they pointed out these things, and, and the understanding's always been there that uh, if you address these issues, you will get your license. That, of course, is not how it's supposed to be. That it's, there's first of all, it's supposed to be a demonstration that the things have been uh, fixed and so on, and then after that, uh, you, you decide to allocate a license. Uh, right now, yes, it, if, if they hadn't given the license now, within in in a week from now, uh, Kubrick would have been legally forced to shut down, and uh, that could have ended ended up in a, in, in a stage of load shedding. You know, that's roughly how much uh, Unit One uh, uh, contributes. Mm. So, in a sense, uh, this whole thing was almost handled with a, almost with a gun to the head of uh, uh, the NNR, saying that well, if you don't give us uh, this license, then you. Uh, 
you're going to be responsible for load shedding. So that's that's uh, that's certainly not uh, uh, not how, uh, how we should be uh, approaching um, th uh, these kind of matters. Gentlemen, please stay on the line. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and when we return, we'll close the conversation in a bit. You watching News at Prime, if you're just joining us, we are wrapping up a conversation around ESCOM's announcement this afternoon that uh, the National Nuclear Regulator has granted the organization a license to continue operating the uh, Kubek Nuclear Power Station Unit 1 and its life extension now, or its life has been extended uh, to 20 44. That's 20 years. And with me still for this conversation is energy expert Helmut Winkler and former National Nuclear Regulator Director Peter Becker. Peter, can I come back to you for a moment? ESCOM being very specific in their statement that, and I quote now, Kubek Unit 1 will join approximately 120 reactors worldwide that have safely continued operations beyond their initial 40-year life. Are we being too hard on ESCOM? Well, firstly, we're not going to know if it's safe or not until the 20 years have passed, right? Um, but there's also an interesting question about what standards have been applied to those other reactors in other countries. And that came across very strongly in the briefing this afternoon uh, when it was um, the well-known Chris Yellen, the reporter, asked whether core catches would be installed as part of the upgrade of the plant. So in France, the requirement of the regulator there is that a ceramic plate is installed beneath the reactor cores so that if there is a loss of coolant accident, which is the worst thing that can happen to a nuclear plant and a core meltdown, that there's a process to stop that penetrating the ground and entering the ground water. And the answer was that no, they're not going to follow that standard. So the fact that 120 or whatever other plants have extended their life doesn't mean too much about what standards the NNR is applying to this particular life extension. And Prof Winkler made a comment there about a gun to her head that I thought was, was quite um, well said. And in fact, while I was a director of the board, this was uh, confidential at the time, but became public because of the court case when I, I took the minister and the NNR to court and, and won, um, is I expressed a concern that there was incremental decision making going on. So we were allowing Kubu to move forward one little step at a time, but then waiting for the final life extension decision at the last moment. And I was concerned this would put us under uh, undue pressure as the board to make a decision. And that was misconstrued as misconduct. And in fact, there were several other cases where um, accusations or allegations of misconduct were fabricated against me. And I was removed from the board, uh, partly for asking that very specific question. And during the Supreme Court um, hearing and the ruling from the Supreme Court uh, from a five judge panel, the most disturbing part for me is that that court found that the NNR board has become advocates for nuclear power. 
So there's a question in my mind is to what degree can we trust a body that has become an advocacy group for nuclear power to make a fair and rational decision when regulating nuclear power? Helmut Winkler, fair accusation against the board? Uh, yes, well, the, 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 the really astonishing statement that came from the previous responsible minister, Minister Mantasha, is that he said something to the effect is, you cannot be on the nuclear regulator if you don't support nuclear. Uh, now, I think, uh, well, Peter Becker was brought in as, as a member of civil society, and that, uh, that can include people who are against uh, nuclear. So it, exa that's exactly what the perception is going to be. And I strongly suspect that there are going to be court cases against this decision uh, sometime in the coming few years. There's, of course, uh, uh, the Stalingrad tactics. I personally think uh, Kubrick is going to carry on running, uh, regardless of how many uh, court cases uh, uh, come. Um, but uh, yes, uh, there is this perception that this, this was a predetermined outcome. And uh, it, un unfortunately, Minister Mantashi reinforced that uh, when he uh, dismissed uh, Peter Becker from, uh, from that board. Yeah. Another aspect we haven't really looked at is the whole question of how much this life extension actually cost. Because mm -hmm. uh, initially when it was conceived, it was supposed to be 20 billion. At least from the financial side, it, that seemed then like a reasonable business property proposition. You keep uh, uh, these 1.8 gigawatts of power going for another 20 years. Uh, that sounded fine. I, I would really like to know... and. <laughs> Eskom really has to tell us how much it really does is going to cost it. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a lot more than 20 billion, and that's going to uh, change uh, the financial equation. Uh, to what extent uh, was it actually worthwhile going through this exercise? Uh, yes, right now, uh, effectively, uh, the country has committed itself to all these upgrades and so on. And uh, imagine if we if if we were now in a situation where uh, the, the, the nuclear regulator said shut it down tomorrow, uh, yeah. all that money would have been completely wasted. Peter Becker, perhaps you have a, uh, the last word there. So, uh, if you have any uh, estimations, at least to your head, about what this is likely to cost the country, yes, there is the amount of twenty billion that has been mentioned. Uh, but also deal with the question of um, the request to separate the operating licenses of these two units. Is there something uh, to talk about there or just uh, it's a mute point? Mm. Well, I think I'd like to focus on the cost question there. And let me very be very plain about this. ESCOM has been lying to the country and has lied to Parliament about what the costs are. When asked, they repeat the 20 billion figure. And we all know that a loaf of bread, what it cost in 2010 is not what it costs now. So if we purely take inflation into account, that 20 billion will turn into approximately 70 billion. But that's only if the project runs on cost and on schedule. Mm -hmm. And uh, Prof Winkler pointed out earlier that a five month job per reactor has turned so far Remember, we're not at the end of it yet, so far into 18 months per reactor. So the time has more than tripled, um, and yet ESCOM keep repeating the 20 billion rand figure. So we know that inflation alone would take it to 70 billion, but if there is a three times cost overrun, for example, that's what happened at Madupi, we might be looking at 210 billion rand. And then we have a situation where what was the cost and what's the benefit? Um, and what are the risks involved? And you say one stage of load shedding quite correctly, but at the moment we passed load shedding. And I think the uptake of renewable energy plus storage has been so dramatic and so much faster once Minister Mantasha got out of the way and, and deregulated it, that we are not going to be back into load shedding. And what has happened is Kuberg was taken offline during a time when we pushed into stage six of load shedding in order to be ready by 2025, which is a time when we don't need Kuburg at all. We can do without that two and a half percent, particularly as the capacity increases and demand has actually fallen. So this is a decision that is serving a very small group of people. And we are now stuck because we don't know how much more it's going to cost. But having gone so far and having approved unit one, it's almost inevitable that unit two will have to be improved uh, approved and whatever it's going to cost is simply going to have to be spent and that's going to be a burden to taxpayers and electricity consumers going into the future. Wow. 
very sobering uh, conversation here. Thank you to both of you, uh, gentlemen. Peter Becker is a former National Nuclear uh, Regulator Director, and Helmut Winkler is an energy expert. Well, if you are listening, and you are indeed uh, the leader of ESCOM, feel free to contact us here for a right of reply. Uh, if you feel that um, what has been mentioned here tonight it is not necessarily the true picture. We welcome you here. Always love to have ESCOM on this show.